I'm going to show you a few of those and what I believe the importance of narrative design is uh, and how it supports mechanics. Um, historical context. I think it's always really important to understand where your speaker came from, what his background is or her background is, uh, in order to put your filters up to understand where that point of view is coming from. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, as most people have, about my journey here and my history. Um, I'll give you a little bit as uh, somebody who's worked at very senior levels in the game business since 2000, just sort of my personal point of view of what's going on next, uh, certainly with new consoles and, and the world. Uh, the Great Wide Open, I'm going to talk about what a lot of people have talked about, the opportunities in games for so many more people with digital distribution and uh, how many game-capable devices everyone has on them. And uh, I'm going to talk, I, I don't know if anybody, I only missed one speaker, and I didn't see anybody go into metrics and data mining consumers and how that works against creative. Um, and I use that word, it's a double-edged sword, against, because you know in our business a lot of people use against as towards, and I think it's both in that case, and I'll talk about that, but I think it's a very important topic with digital in terms of data mining consumers and what that does to create a vision and what it, well, how it can help it and how it can hurt it. And um, in the end, I'm going to talk about connected IP, which is essentially where I'm headed next and what that means to me and hopefully what it'll mean to all of you in success. Um, I've been teaching for, throughout my career in games, I've also been teaching at the University of Southern California and I've, I've consistently taught a class on game narrative or narrative design. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week was our last week of school for this semester. And this is a question I always put up in the first week of class, and I thought it might be fun here, is what's more important, the core mechanics or the fictions and characters? And you don't have to answer it. I'm talking to professionals here, and it's the gameplay. So I don't want anybody to think that I had a history in Hollywood and I wrote a lot of stuff that I think it's all about narrative. It's not. I think that narrative can support mechanics and can make the user care about them more and get people more emotionally engaged in games. But the core mechanics are everything. The objective reward systems are everything. And polish and tuning and things like that are everything. Now, moving right along, um, raw mechanic. Now I'm making my start to make my points about the importance of IP. So. I think what's brilliant about Angry Birds is, from my point of view, is the Angry Birds. Um, that mechanic, I mean, even when I was at EA in LA, they made a Wii game called Boom Blocks, which was quite a fun game. I believe Steven Spielberg had his name on it. And it was a similar mechanic, physics game. You throw stuff at the figs, you knock the blocks down. Boom Blocks. Boom Blocks, Angry Birds. What's more relatable? Emotionally, what has more character? Story? Mm, I don't know, but they're making a movie and a TV show and all this stuff. So those characters. I think that idea of Angry Birds was genius. Was genius. Yes, it was a polished mechanic. Yes, it is a polished mechanic. Yes, it was easy to play. But using the imagination and the creative side and the right side of the brain, the non-engineering part comes the Angry Birds, which makes it appeal in a certain way and make people relate to it and talk about it. Um, now with established mechanics, meaning once you've got beautiful polished mechanics and you're making a series, I actually think that narrative and character can become more important at that point. So I use the examples of games like Halo, Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed. There's not a ton of new features in those games every year. Ideally, a developer wants to have at least one that they can market. But where do they go? It suddenly becomes more about fiction character and maybe the new feature. But when you hear about um, the next Assassin's Creed, what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about pirates. You're going to talk about the seas. You're going to talk about ships. Maybe you'll talk about what mechanics you might be able to do on those. Call of Duty, I don't know how many new features. I guess in the multiplayer, they'll add new features every year. Beautifully made game. These are big, expensive games, by the way. I mean, everybody knows these are top of the class in terms of budget and sales. But what are we talking about now? We're talking about Call of Duty Ghosts. We're talking about a character. I watched their trailer. It was all about the warrior and masks. It wasn't about Twitch or scoring or leaderboards or even what's new in multiplayer. It was all about the fiction. Um, 
moving right along. So now we've got GTA 5 coming up. We know they make a wonderful game. We know that their mechanics are tight. We know they invest unbelievable resource in these games to give us great entertainment. But how are they communicating that to us? And how can they communicate to that to us now? Um, what I'm seeing is it's about three characters and it's about their stories. And essentially, they're selling the movie. I'm not being critical of this. I'm just talking about the fantastic partnership between narrative and mechanics. I, that's what excites me. Now, we have a game, and I use that term a little loosely on this one for us hardcore game guys. Um, the Walking Dead, as you, as you know, in the States, the show was huge. Uh, this developer, Telltale Games, has been doing really cool point-and-click games. I believe they came out of LucasArts, and, and some of those guys have worked on some of the great games historically that I loved, the uh, Indiana Jones, the Tim Schafer stuff, uh, really great games. I mean, Grim Fandango is one of the great works of art of our industry over the last 20 years. But these guys came out and they made, you know, Sam and Max, some of the stuff they were doing before. They did a Jurassic Park, they did Back to the Future, and I use this term figuratively, no one cared. They were very smart and they licensed the graphic novel, they actually didn't license the TV series, and they went off on a parallel fiction path, and they built a game that is the biggest fiction game I've ever seen. The mechanics are completely secondary to the fiction, and I would propose this game, this game, what surprised me was how the hardcore gaming press was nominating this as game of the year, game of the year, game of the year, all over the place, and how much game there is is nothing compared to how much narrative there is. This game is completely dependent on the quality of its narrative and the quality of its actors who are performing in this game. And they, the developers or the game writers talked to GDC about our mechanics are derived from narrative. Now that's something I've never come across in my time in the game industry, but it's really interesting. And if you can do quality storytelling, you can do those kinds of limited mechanics and succeed. And they are insanely successful with this game. And I look forward to what they do next. And I would really love it if they would do an original. OK, one of the things about narrative design I talk about a lot is relatable space. And what was interesting was Will talked about it yesterday in his own way, talking about reality. And what he was saying is, is that a wider audience can relate. What's relatable space? I think The Sims was the ultimate relatable space game. It's a house. And it was people in a house. And everything you do in that game, you took relatable space. And I worked on the first one uh, with Will. You would take relatable space, and at least initially, when I was really following it, you messed with it. And you broke it, and you messed with it, and you had fun with that toy set. But everything about it was relatable. If you were walling off somebody in a closet, that's relatable to something from life. You weren't dealing with Men in Tights and Space Marines, which I love, but that everybody doesn't love that, but everybody gets a house. Yesterday, and I threw this one in there last night, because the thing about Surgeon Simulator that I thought was so interesting was that if it was auto mechanic, it wouldn't have the same value. It wouldn't be the same proposition for the user. It wouldn't have the same humor. They wouldn't be posting all these YouTubes of, look, I put a carburetor where the battery goes. That's not so funny, but if you start messing with anatomy and stuff that everybody has an emotional connection to and feels about, suddenly you have a hit. Again, narrative design. OK, um, these are some of the things that, that I've had students come back to me who've been very successful in the industry and said, I loved your class. It was really important. It's really helped me in my new job. And I said, what? What about it? And they always came back to these things. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot is we don't tell stories in the traditional sense in games. We tell them through objectives and rewards. And that's a really interesting way to approach it and tell your stories. Then over the years, I developed this little, these three questions as you're developing your narrative. And I thought I'd just put them up if this has any value for anybody in here who's watching. But it seems I've had a lot of value for my student and for myself as I develop narrative. Very simple stuff. What do the good guys want? What do the bad guys want? And what are the stakes? What are the stakes means if the bad guys win, what happens? If the good guys win, what happens? It's a very basic thing, but if you 
put your narrative through that machine, through that filter, it, I believe it asks the right questions to help you get to the right place. It's amazing to me how many times in narrative development I've seen stuff that was really weak and just start asking those questions and then it starts to, to come together. And then of course game fiction is really stringing together memorable moments and letting the user create the story in their mind. I mean that's absolutely critical. Um, emergent narrative. Will talked about this again yesterday too and I agree with him. I agree with him that if we can create games by how we set it up and what props we place and what we do um, and that the user builds it in their imagination. I also liked one of the presentations yesterday by the, uh, the gentleman who makes Hearts of Iron and those deep strategy games. And he also talked about this emergent narrative. What are the stories we tell each other about our experience? Those are more important than the stories that I write or the other writers who write on games. You have to be able to, that's what games are about, about creating it in your own, having your own choices, making your own decisions, having your own experiences. Um, and the next story, I, I want to tell a little story. This is about 1999, EverQuest 1. And my, I work with a writing partner I have for, for 30 years over all the television and film, and he's done some work in games with me. And in that year, we were working for Paramount, and I'll get to this, but it was always fun. we were always playing games in the office. I would just... I didn't mind if somebody walked in, we're in the entertainment business, it's fine. Well, one year we got a little too lost in EverQuest, uh, Paul and I. And it was, my, uh, it was my daughter's high school graduation, and we had to get to this graduation party, but we were playing EverQuest, and what had just happened in this dungeon, we were two little dwarves, level 13, I'll never forget this, and Paul's dwarf fell down a well. And he fell down a well five levels, and the way that was designed was that each level had higher mobs down there. So he was a level 13, and now he's down there on a level with level 25 mobs, enemies, for those of you who don't play MMOs. And it was incredible. I could jump up on the well, I could look down there, I could see him, he could look up at me, he's waving, and we did not know what to do, and oh my God, we had to get to my daughter's graduation party. So we run to the house, we get there, there's all these people in the backyard, and all we could talk about was the story of two dwarves in a dungeon, and one of them fell down a well, and we had no rope, that wasn't a mechanic, that wasn't something in your inventory that they could give you, so for you game designers who are wondering, why didn't you? Um, and he, we knew he couldn't move or he was gonna get whacked, and in that game, back then, if you remember that game, if you die, you ha all your loot would die with your body, and you'd have to go back and retrieve it with no weapons or anything. So it was this unbelievable problem and this unbelievable story that we were telling. We had 35 people trying to ponder how we were going to get out of this. I don't think my daughter's ever forgiven me for that for a graduation party. But my point is, is those designers, I don't remember the name of that dungeon. I don't remember the monsters. I don't remember the fiction that was written. But man, do I remember the emergent narrative that was there. I'll never forget it. And... Uh, it's one of many I've come across in, in my wonderful years playing games. Okay, historical context. This is about me, so you can get where's all this noise coming from. Um, I grew up, when I was 10 year, 11 years old, I moved to this neighborhood with where they just nerded out, as a guy yesterday said. It was a board gaming uh, mania. We didn't play stickball in the streets. We weren't playing as much of that. Everybody was into board games. I got moved from Risk through Avalon Hill. As Will was talking about him and Sid Meier, and I have had the privilege of working with Will and Peter Molyneux and some other great designers, the board game reference was really powerful for us in terms of how did I learn what I learned about design, especially after being in the film business for 20 years, and I'll get to that. My board gaming taught me everything because all that stuff that are systems now and are run behind the scenes in a board game, you got to look at you got to look at those combat results tables. You've got to roll the dice. You learn about randomized events. You learn about all that stuff. So it was wonderful. I still love board games. And the great thing about video games when they came along was I didn't have to find the people to play them with. And ultimately, as I went on, find more board game geeks like myself, which at one point were fewer. I think there's more now because video games have gotten people more into gaming. Um, so I remember in 1997, under the Christmas tree, I got an Atari 2600 and it blew my mind and maybe some of you had the same experience. 
You were probably eight. I was 20. Um, I took it to college with me. College in the 70s, video games, color TV was insane. And we just, I thought, you know, that horrible joystick, remember? It would just kill your thumb, kill your hand. But I fell in love with video games. It wasn't that a new thing, because it was games. And I always loved games. Um, then I went through, because I've been growing up, and I'll get to this, what I call the golden age of the console, which is the PS2 era, which was video games sold because they're video games. It was amazing. Everybody was making stuff and making money hand over fist. It was crazy. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And now we come to the, uh, the digital age. Now, my history. Started out in B-movies in the 80s. Um, I was, in college, I was a theater major. Um, I s suck at math, OK? So all you engineers are awesome, need you all day long to get those great ideas onto a screen. I can't, I can add, I can subtract. When we get to division, it gets a little complex, and I'm in trouble. Um, I made B-movies in the 80s, and I got picked up at Warner Brothers. I was at Warner Brothers Television for six years. I made two or three television shows. The one I'm the most proud of was called The Flash, based on the DC Comics character. Uh, the only, if you remember it, it was like 1991. Maybe you weren't born. I don't know. But you know the character, because he's been around longer than all of us, Charles. And, <laughs> and uh, Funny anecdote, just what the crazy business is like, not that different than games with executives. Remember going to CBS, and the head of CBS said, yeah, but can't he just wear a track suit and have like tennis shoes with LEDs in them or something? Because we don't think you can put a guy in a costume on film. Um, well, we fought that one. And, and at the same time, I was working on a project called The Rocketeer. Uh, which I had written the comics and worked with the artist. And I had him, who was a phenomenal artist, a guy named Dave Stevens, who passed away in 2008. Uh, I had him redesign and draw the Flash costume, came in with his art, and we got it built. Had the guy who did the Batman suits for Michael Keaton build our Flash suit. And then we went on to be, you know what's funny is we were canceled after one year. The numbers we had in those days of audience watching would have been the number one show on television now. And we were canceled. But it was, it was, on, the, it was on the edge. Um, after that, I went to Walt Disney Pictures, where I worked in the film department for a while. I did The Rocketeer, and then we developed motion pictures there for a few years. I did an early draft of Princess of Mars, which became John Carter many, many, many years later. Uh, I liked our script a lot. The, uh, after that, I went to Paramount, where I was at for eight years. And there I did. Um, a series called The Sentinel, about a cop with hypersenses. These all played on sci-fi here. And then uh, Viper, which was a syndicated show. Um, I'm just telling you all this just for the lead up to how I got in the game business. The, uh, when I was making those shows, I was making them in Vancouver, Canada. And I used to commute back and forth to Los Angeles. And on that plane was always a working trip for me. And one flight, I was busy working on my script. And the guy next to me said, are you a producer? And I just was like, oh, no. Oh, no, I, I can't talk. I've only got another hour till we land, and I've got to get these script notes done because I'm going right to a meeting. And I didn't even look up. I just said, yeah. And he threw his card on top of my script, and the card said, Don Matrick, president of Electronic Arts. Now, background, I told you I was a big gamer. I was always a big gamer. I bought everything I could. I played everything I could. I cared more about video games than that job I was working on. And I just went, hi. And, uh, <laughs> We became friends, and when my shows ended, about a year later, Don recruited me into um, EA to work on The Sims with Will. The Sims had been in development for a few years, and there was some concerns of, this is really hard to say, there were some concerns with a lack of direction. Uh, when I got up to Maxis, uh, I think they brought us in because we wanted to bring some TV guys in because they make it like a TV show. Well. The good news and the bad news was I wasn't interested in making TV shows. I'd been doing that. I wanted to make games, and I wanted to get close to people who were making games. And this was amazing to me. And what I got there was a really interesting, Will was really interested in architecture and an architecture simulator. He actually said that yesterday as the inspiration for The Sims. But what he had in the game were, do you, I don't know if you guys remember this old show. It was called Three's Company. And it was about a guy living with two girls. So The Sims, when I got there, was about 
a guy and two girls in a house, or two girls and a guy in a house, and I'm like, wait a minute, you did SimCity. SimCity is all about growth and building. Where are the kids? Where are the family? Where's the career? Where's all this stuff? And that got them to thinking, open things up a bit. Of course, I had management support, which helps open things up with a design team when some Hollywood guy is coming in, which is something I've had to brave many times with many design teams. I've become an expert at working my way past that. Um, and I was like, I came back the next week to Will and I said, oh man, we should do this like SimCity. You should start, like, you can either go to college or go right to work. You start a little apartment, you got a dorm room. I had all these missions. Okay, you've got the foreign exchange student who doesn't speak English and how do you communicate with blah, blah, blah. And he said, Danny, I don't want to do that much structure. I build sandboxes. And I was like, okay, you're the boss. He was right, by the way, totally right. Even though it's his last name, he was right. And uh, we went on. So we wound up, we did get kids in the game. We didn't get pets in then because they were just like, we can't animate quadrupeds, we can't animate quadrupeds. Okay. Um, we wrote the career tracks. We put a little bit of structure in it. And we helped them through the last year of production um, pull it together. And some people there give me more credit. Some people give me less credit. I don't really care. I participated in that game. Now, I'll be very frank, but as a hardcore gamer, that was not my game. That was not my dream to work on. I understood the game. I understood the relatability of the game. I understood what a great game it is to cross demographics for females and males. But it wasn't something when the builds came in, I was like, I can't wait to play. It was more like, OK. Um, also, my job has always been creating stories. That's a game where the gameplay is creating stories. Right? So it felt like work to me a bit. Now, as soon as that shipped and it was a giant hit, they offered me a job. As a, as a vice president at EA, and I went on to um, work on uh, the Harry Potter franchise, the James Bond franchise, and the Medal of Honor franchise. And I spent a lot of time here on the first three or four Harry Potter games, made a lot of friends, and one of the things I've enjoyed about this conference is sort of being back around British development, which is really awesome, um, innovative, original, and just seeing you guys again and hearing them. And a lot of my friends aren't here because they're working, but in their studios around or not. But um, that's, that, that was a fantastic experience. I was the guy who got to go to Edinburgh and work with Joe Rowling on all the fiction stuff and the stuff going back and forth. Incredible time. Worked on the Bond games and all of the stuff that goes along with that. And I will tell you how I, I just look at my time there. I will tell you how I uh, wound up leaving Electronic Arts, and that my mentor at the company is a guy named Bing Gordon, who I absolutely adore. I think he's one of the, he's one of the founders of EA. He's one of the geniuses I've, I've had the privilege to work with. And he said to myself and Frank Jabot, who's now president of EA, he said, you two guys need to executive produce a game. You really need to round out your education. And I was like, OK. And Frank was like, uh-uh. And Frank was really smart, and I was really stupid, and I went into EALA to make my dream game, which was going to be a James Bond bad guy game called Goldfinger versus Dr. No. And then I got into the heart of 2004 PS2 development crush and what was going on at EA at the time. And it was like, you had nine months to make that game. The other team at the studio was supposed to be redeveloping the tech. Uh, the tech wasn't showing You guys all know these stories. The tech wasn't showing up. The dream was crashing. And in those days, I was arrogant enough to say, I'm out of here. So I showed it at E3, and I left because I, didn't, I just couldn't watch the dream go down. Now, that was financially pretty stupid for myself, and I would probably never do that again. But at that time, I left, um, went back, wrote some comics. Now, I have USC up there because starting right around then, I started teaching at SC. I talked about that a little bit before. Um, what I will say is we are officially one of the finest game schools in the world. We've been voted number one in the United States most of the last few years. There's a few other schools that kind of mix it up with us for different reasons. We are heavily funded by people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, and we've got a brand new building opening in the fall, an entire building for the game school, for Interactive. It's incredible, and if any of you are ever in LA, I'd be happy to host you. It's really great, and the students coming out of there are doing really cool stuff, and now they're enabled to do really cool stuff because of digital and some of the things like Alistair talked about today. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Then we get to THQ. Um, 
I'll be honest with you, when I was making the deck and I started pulling the logo down, I felt bad. I'll be honest. Um, it's just sad. It's sad um, what happened. But my story there was, I got there, I was brought in by the, the guys who were there before me, who were in the process of transitioning the company to a core games original IP company, and they brought me in to help with that. And they were really good guys. And the first six weeks on that job, I got there, there were 17 studios. 17 studios in 2008. Weird thing going on, though. Six of them didn't know what they were making. They were just burning, and, and it was like, Danny, get out there and help. There were some of the smaller studios, but get out there and help them get their green lights going, help them get their creative going, help them get their price. This is the most awesome job I've ever had in my life. I'm now going to game studios and helping guys find what they want to make with the power to say, yeah, let's go do it, and influence it back at corporate and all that. I remember telling my friends, this is the best job I've ever had. And then about eight weeks in, I got a phone call from my boss that said, uh, we have to cut about 50% of the production budget. And I was like, wow. He goes, you know all this great stuff you just set up? We've got to kill it all. If you want to leave, you can leave. I was like, oh, wow. Um, no, I, I don't want to leave. I mean, I want to try to make this work. So we shut, I believe, seven studios right then. And the guys, the other, exec, the other guys, the execs in production were really cool. And they said, you're the creative guy. We're not going to send you out there to shut them. And I don't know how many of you know how that tends to work in the game business. It's like a surprise attack. It's like you walk up, you walk in, they, it's, it's, there's no prep, everything gets shut. It's awful. I, I apologize to any of you who have gone through it. I've been on both sides of it. It's one of the worst things I've ever experienced. Um, but that happened, and then they fired my boss. And they said, Danny, you and these two other guys, you guys are going to run the studios. You, Danny, you handle the creative, as a finance guy, as a production guy. A few months later, the head of publishing left the company. And the weirdest thing happened. I was actually with Frank Jabot at a conference doing something else. And I get this call. And he said, the marketing guys want to report to you. I was like, whoa, well, I've never even been in a marketing department. Um, and I thought, if I can get control of marketing and production, and I didn't set this up right, but I can heal one of the biggest problems I saw at the company when I was there early on, which was that marketing and production were crashing into each other like that. I mean, there was just, they were, it was antagonistic, basically. And if I could get them under one roof, I can get some marketing guys in the studios, and I can try to build one team out of this, and we can get some quality marketing that the developers don't hate, basically. Um, and that was, I consider, one of my biggest successes of that company was bringing those two teams together. And I think you saw in the stuff that we started to do, um, Better vision, better marketing, we got better response, and we started to bring some hope into the place. Uh, in the end, I would say that, now I left a year ago, and I have to say I do not know, and this is the truth, I do not know what happened in the last eight months there. I do not know. When I left, there was no talk of bankruptcy. There was no talk of anything like that. It was really tough times, and we were trying to sell stuff off, but we were determined to live to fight another day, and we had a portfolio of games that people were really responding to. And a year ago when I was here in the UK, um, I was showing them to some of you from the press. And it was good stuff. It was Company Heroes 2, it was Metro, it was Darksiders 2 in that trip. And there's a few more games. All of the stuff got bought. And these were all the games that I greenlit with and that my team built and the studios built for us. Um, and all that stuff will come out. And I look forward to it. And there were great teams there. And I look forward to them being successful in the future. Um, a lot of great people there, really terrible what happened. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me. I, I, I gave it all I had, but it didn't work. And I think they couldn't change fast enough from a culture of kids licensed games to a culture of core games. And then the business was changing faster than we could change. And I think that's sort of my takeaway on what happened. Um, but wonderful people there, really worked hard, gave it their all. I see you from Blitz back there. I know you did a lot of great work for the other group at our studio. I always heard great things about you guys. Um, there was a whole kids family group that I wasn't in charge of, and that included you draw and all that stuff. So moving right along, what's next? So of course, I've 
been an insider for now 10 or you know, 14 years. I was on, in management teams. So I have some idea of certainly what the next-gen consoles are. You all do. And on May 21st, you'll have the other half of the, the equation. Um, where I think it's going is 10 or 12 games a year that are really going to matter at the high-end, super expensive, uh, old-school console tradition, but they're really going to matter, and they're going to be unbelievable, and they're going to be awesome, and uh, they're going to be heavily marketed and heavily supported, and they're going to be given time to be great because there's so much risk in them. And I know people like Mark sitting there is going to help support some of these unbelievable experiences that we're going to have in the future. But I'm talking about maybe a dozen where in the golden age, when I was at EA in the PS2 days, man, it was like, I can't even tell you how many titles. I think we had like 70 titles in a year, something crazy like that. But there's going to be some awesome entertainment coming, and I can't wait to see it at E3. But it's going to be for the few, the proud, the wealthy. You know, I mean, not to buy, I mean to make. It's going to be for the biggest companies with the biggest resources uh, to pull off, and there's going to be some incredible entertainment. Now, as they talked about yesterday, there's a lot of, a lot of the, I watch all my stuff on my Xbox now. All my places. I watch my Netflix. I watch my HBO Go. I tend to stream my content. I play my games. A lot of people do it on the PlayStation. Just depends what room I'm in. Um, entertainment networks are what these guys want to become, and where that's going to come to is exclusive content. Like if you see Netflix is now doing its own productions, you know that Microsoft has set up Microsoft Entertainment in Los Angeles with a very successful and experienced television executive to bring television to Xbox. Um, so I think you're going to see some of that, because it's going to be how do they differentiate. Um, and that will be, if it's exclusive, it'll drive you to the platform. And then, of course, digital distribution everywhere and possibly on that platform. I think Mark clued us into that yesterday. He might be right. OK, now, the rest of it, which is the most unbelievable thing for we are now back to the old days, like when I was a fanboy buying cassettes in a bag at the store, where four guys, well, I saw one guy today, four or five guys can make a game in an apartment they're sharing, eating ramen noodles and busting their asses, and they can break out a hit. That is fantastic. The open market of this will just breed innovation. It allows for innovation. When you've got a $100 million bet, Doing an innovative game is really tough, really, really tough. We would do, try to get innovative features in, because we know the gamers want the innovative features, but really tough. Um, there's more opportunity to launch. And this has been talked about a lot here. But how, when there's a billion games, and you don't really have a marketing budget, and you don't have sort of the kind of direct marketing you had, how do you market these things? How do you make them pop? So. I'm going to, wow, I, I thought I was going to be short, and all right, that clock is ticking. Um, I'm going to talk about this for a minute, because this is a big issue, is metrics and analytics. Now you're getting real-time data on every aspect of your game, and my question is, what do you do with it? I interviewed at a big company last year for a very senior creative job, and I got into a little bit of a tangle between the producers who are statisticians, and myself. And my proposal is these metrics are really valuable, but they don't drive creative. They only look backwards. And you'll wind up repeating the same things. However, they're really valuable to use as an inspirational tool to go forwards and to measure success. So I think they're critical because they're telling you what the audience is doing, but they're not telling you what the audience is going to do. So there's always. Innovation comes from the heart. It comes from the imagination. It comes from somebody in the shower half the time. You know, somebody walking down the street and they get this idea. And those ideas don't come from metrics. They come from the heart. They come from human inspiration. And they always have. And that's what art is. Um, I've got some examples. These were last week in the uh, New York Times. And this one was about. It's the same point. It's about crowdsourcing. And I have this expression I used to give to the teams all the time, is if you mix all the colors of the rainbow, you get brown. And it means that in crowdsourcing, you get a majority, but 
what truth is that that you get? What truth is it you get? You get a majority. It used to be the power of the individual was everything. Now it's all about peer pressure, maybe. And then the nuttiest one, this was just May 5th, was there was an article in the New York Times about this company that's saying for $20,000, we will analyze your film script. It's coming. Don't worry. There's guys who will do it for games, too. And we'll tell you what works and what doesn't work. Man, if anybody could tell me what works and what doesn't work for real, I'd do it. And so would everybody else. And we'd all be rich and we'd all go home. And we'd, we'd work a lot less hard. OK, where I'm going next. Um, after I left THQ, a really awesome recruiter said to me, I said, I said, what do you need? Do you need my resume? You know, what do you need? I need to get a job. And they said, Danny, what do you want to do? And, and she caught me like dead. I hadn't even expected that I didn't know. Actually, after that rough ride of four and a half years, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I decided, um, what have I done? And I showed you guys what I've done. I've worked in, in games and in film, and I'm like, I've actually been trying to combine them some way the whole time in little starts and burps. I mean, I had some deals with, in my last job where we had Sci-Fi make a Red Faction movie for us. We didn't pay for it because they were leveraging our marketing and our investment. We had Sony make a little Company of Heroes movie, but of course the game was sold off and it didn't time with the release. It actually came out in February. Those were little experiments that were zero risk for us in the game business because we had interesting IP that they wanted to develop. And as long as we managed it uh, creatively and kept it from being bad or hurting the game, it was, a, it was a cool experiment. But now, what I want to do, what I'm going to do, is I've partnered with a guy, a, a movie producer named Lloyd Levin, who I've known for years. He actually produced The Rocketeer. But he's also produced the Tomb Raider movies, the Watchmen film, uh, the Hellboy movies, as well as some really awesome things like United 93 and some more straight dark films. So Lloyd and I got together and we said, let's make micro budget film series for streaming because the hardware now enables us to play the game and watch the film on the same device. And let's launch, let's say, three episodes a year. And these are two hour episodes. And in between, thank you, Telltale Games, we will do a narrative game of three or four chapters, but we're going to go one step up and we're going to add a bunch of different features and a little more interactivity. And let's take the fan from the game, from the film, through three chapters of the game, right into the next film. We've got the writers of the film writing the game narrative. We've got the actors, likeness, voice, scan, and the players, fans, can participate in the narrative up to a point, and then rejoin the film narrative. And it's all delivered on the same devices, the PC, the pads, or any, any digital device. And this is where we're going. We've got, they're all science fiction, fantasy, and horror stuff that makes good gaming. And uh, we are very close to announcing our distribution partners. And this is where I'm going next. We're going to do three of these. I'm combining what I've been doing my whole career we go digital comics is a given. We can extend the story there. But no one has ever been able to literally move the story from linear to interactive-ish, linear, to game, and back to linear. And the reason is, because I did a lot of this in my job when I was doing Potter and Bond and some Batman, there's a huge wall between uh, the film guys and the game guys, and you can't have that, and you can't have that, and you can't tell that part of the story, and the game guys can't do that, and you wound up with the movie game, which thank God is dead, because it was a pretty rotten, rotten aspect of our art form. Um, but we're talking about building both pieces under the same roof with the same producers and having an unbelievable verisimilitude, and hopefully, if one of these hits, fantastic, because the price of entry is nothing like the kind of dice I was rolling on my last job. It's, it's really nothing compared to that. So um, I left a few things out. That's where you go when you have a hit. Then you go to your, uh, then you do a TV show, webisodes, books, comic books, toys, more toys, more collectibles, because I like them, more stuff like that. Um, I'm just watching the clock here, so I'm going to go right to questions, because I'm sure you might have a few.
that was fascinating. Oh no, we've lost the ball. Ah, oh, Nikki's got it. Great. Right, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I just want to see somebody do a header with that thing to the next guy. <laughs> Thank you for an absolutely terrific talk. That was fantastic. I have, I have two questions. Um, the, um, one of the sort of phrases in our world at the moment is games as a service. Um, I, I make a game called CSR Racing, which is exactly this kind of thing. It was, the game's nine months old. My job is to keep it running and keep interesting things happening. And sometimes as I do that, I kind of think that we are almost like running t a TV station or a club. It's, but it's very much a, feels like a series. I'm trying to keep my audience fed. And I wonder if there is any parallel, if you see any parallel between approaching a game as a service in that sense. It, I'm, using, I'm thinking about the word narrative here. I, feel, I use the word narrative as I'm just trying to design this, the calendar of our game. Um, and I wonder if there's any parallel between that and the sort of narratives that you have talked about in the sense of uh, making TV series. Absolutely. I just, you know, I like to call them live games because games as a service sounds like it's so dry. Yeah. You know, it's like the butler or something. Um, but they're live, and they're alive. They're like live television, except in live television, they couldn't get that data back that you guys are getting on what's working and what's not working. So absolutely parallel, and as far as creative development, absolutely parallel in terms of evolving your, whatever your game story is. And it can be, you know, I didn't go through my lecture on how game story can be almost every kind of game, including sports. It's always the story you tell. But absolute parallel. And my second question is, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's a question that many people in this room have, which is, how do you get the dwarf out the well? <laughs> That's really awesome that you asked that question. A party of level 25s came along and escorted him out. Oh, nice. And I'm thankful to those guys for years. It's been, it was fantastic. Really, not a very good mechanic, actually, that whole leave your loot and have to go get it. It was a pain, and it was wiped out a long time ago in MMOs. But it created this crazy situation. Anybody else? You don't have a ball mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the ball in a minute, Mark. Um, <laughs> I've done it. Um, you say that the, the golden age of consoles for you was the PlayStation and uh, GameCube. Well, not just for you, but in general. Um, what were your favorite games on those? From that generation? From that generation, what were your favorite games? Don't wow. say James uh, You know what? It's, it's, I'm going back. There were some Japanese games that I really liked. There was one I worked on I thought was great was Medal of Honor Frontline. I thought that was a pretty cool game. Um, the sports. Yeah. Okay, I got to say that the EA Sports stuff was fantastic. I play both footballs, yours and ours, um, you know, like crazy. Uh, and that the ability to have that kind of sports experience then was really good. What's funny is like a lot of people, I thought, what more do I need? Mm. You know, it all, it's all so good. And that's what happened with this generation, too. What more do I need? Um, and if you ask me what am I most looking forward to seeing at E3, the sports <laughs> on the next gen. Come on, you. <laughs> There's one. Yeah, whatever you want. At least time. Hi. Uh, Obviously, you cannot reveal too much information about your new project, but what is the difference between just a, a game in chapters with extended cutscenes and what you're, what you're making? A game in chapters with extended cutscenes. Um, the big difference is the writing. It's all about the narrative quality of it. Again, I have to go to The Walking Dead because somebody's already proved it. With, with quality writing and quality, I, you know, the gameplay, it's hard to say. It's an interactive cutscene. What I promise is we're going way beyond that in interactivity and features. So um, I don't want to, you know, I've learned my lessons in the business. I don't want to 
tell my, the whole story of that. I want to be able to roll that out with the, with the features. But there's some very unique and engaging features that we're going to do that they haven't done yet up there. And I have all the respect in the world for them. But we're going to try to um, have a little more interactivity and a little more ownership for the player. All right. Um, oh, okay. Really fascinating. Thank you so much. Damn it. Thanks for having me. And as, as if it was planned, um, we have three minutes before the barbecue starts in the Baltic Centre. Um, that's going to be on the River Terrace. Um, the Baltic Centre, for those who don't know, is out that way, turn right, and it's the big building at the end. Um, but, or, or rather, just follow everybody else. So before we do that, though, we want to thank the sponsors. The sponsors are incredibly important to events like this, uh, and I believe that we're going